Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is award-winning author and veterinary epidemiologist David Waltner Taves. He's published seven collections of poetry, one of which includes recipes, a collection of short stories, a murder mystery, six books of popular science, and several texts and manuals on ecosystem approaches to health. From meditations on the origins of feces, which I'd love to talk about too, to elegant terzanelles on the meaning of life, from human diseases we get from other animals, to what food, sex, and salmonella share with each other, he celebrates the whole complex mess of life, which I think we all need to do. A university professor emeritus at University of Guelph, he was founding president of Veterinarians Without Borders Canada and of the Network for Ecosystem Sustainability and Health, and a founding member of Communities of Practice for Ecosystem Approaches to Health in Canada. He's the recipient of the inaugural award for contributions to ecosystem approaches to health from the International Association for Ecology and Health. So first, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program. Uh, you're very welcome. Glad to be here. So what is um, ecosystem approaches to health? What, what, what does that mean? <laughs> it's a can of worms. And no, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you a, a the, 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 the core idea is that, um, we try to think about health in ecological terms. Generally, we've been trained uh, in most, certainly in Western societies, but in many societies, you hear the word health, you think doctor, and you think uh, a treatment of some sort. And certainly if you're in an emergency, uh, you don't want to negotiate with somebody in the emergency room about you know, your blood loss and so on. You expect there to be some expertise, and they make a decision, and they save your life. As soon as you start talking about health in a more general sense. I mean, the, the World Health Organization talks about uh, complete social, physical, and emotional well-being or something uh, to that effect, and not simply the absence of disease. As soon as we start going there, then there are all these interactions that happen, and it's not just an individual thing. So I, to give you an example, people might, and I've seen this, they will drink health health food drinks, if you want, you know, uh, blended carrots or something like this, and they'll drink them out of plastic bottles. And I'm going, that, that I find that really jarring because it, it prioritizes my immediate uh, sort of physical status over the health of everything else around me, which will determine the future of, you know, everybody else on the planet. And to me, it's looking at those kinds of dynamics. So initially... If we, if I look at it historically, if you want, there was, um, somebody took the notion of health. Well, David Rapport and a few other people took the notion of health and applied it to ecosystems. So there was, they called it ecosystem health. And I stepped, I got involved at that point because I was working as a, a veterinary epidemiologist and, and I'll, I can come at it from that point a, a little bit later, but. So the idea was you take ideas of health and you apply them to ecosystems. Can we see if an ecosystem is healthy or not? Can we improve its health? Um, it was, I always had a kind of niggling um, a sense of unease because it seemed to take medical ideas and try to apply them to ecosystems, which don't have the same boundaries, which don't have the same which have very complex interactions internally. And they assume that there's somebody outside who's applying some criteria to make it better somehow. Um, and my sense was that, well, for most of the things we're dealing with, we're actually inside the system and we're trying to understand what's going on and, and improve the well-being not just of ourselves, but of other species that are there. So there was a gradual shift in, in among some of us anyway, that that the idea was not to take health ideas and uh, or medical ideas and to simply apply them to ecosystems in some sort of a, you know, you got a checklist here, temperature, pulse, respiration, uh, clean water, this much growth, th those kinds of things. Um, but to say, well, can we think in ecological terms about, about human health and animal health and uh, the sustainability or resilience or health of the environment uh, around us. Now, I came at this from the veterinary side, but particularly my background was in, in 
an epidemiology of diseases that people get from animals. So it's the interaction between people and animals. Nobody used to care about it. It was like some people got salmonella, some people got rabies, but it was pretty rare. And then in the 90s, it seemed to explode. Everybody was at least focusing on it. So we had SARS and Lyme disease and West Nile virus and all these things, and they seemed to come out of nowhere. In fact, they didn't come out of nowhere, but we became more aware of them. So that the notion was then, okay, where are they coming from? And this goes back to my own tendency to to keep asking why, you know, animal is sick. Well, why is it sick? Because it ate this or it lived in this kind of housing or uh, those kinds of uh, questions. Well, why was it in that environment? Well, because um, if it's wildlife, because we fenced them off, or if it's a domestic animal, because we fed them these certain things. Well, why did we do that? Well, uh, to the annoyance of a lot of people, I just kept going on this because if you're in practice, you have to at some point say, well, okay, we have a pretty good idea what the organism that's causing this disease is, so we'll treat it with penicillin or whatever. But I'm, I'm standing back and going, okay, we saved that animal, but there's another animal and another animal and another animal, or there's another person, another person, another person. You stand back, well, let's, what's going on? Why are we seeing so many of these cases? Uh, and so at some point, instead of having a lot of in, um, and I'm putting this now in, uh, with a, a disease focus because that's where a lot of this stuff initially kind of emerged from, at least uh, the communities I interact with. So um, if, if you see a lot of cases, you know, people coming in with broken legs, you say, well, maybe there's, you know, there's an accident out there or something, and we should look at road safety. In terms of animals, you say, well, you, there's an epidemic going on. Maybe we should look at why there's an epidemic. What seemed to happen was we were getting epidemics of epidemics. So we were getting SARS and avian influenza and West Nile virus and all. They just kept happening and happening. And then the question is, if you've got, if you want epidemics of epidemics, then there's some kind of a systemic malfunction going on. This isn't simply here's this disease, let's prevent it. Here's that disease, let's prevent it. There are some kinds of interactions there that we're not paying attention to that are causing these things to happen. And so ecosystem approaches to health or eco-health came out of that. And again, initially, a lot of it was came out of, um, what should I say? There was a whole community focused on uh, the epidemiology of zoonotic diseases, diseases people get from animals. And there was a lot of money has gone into that because there's money that go, you know, if people are getting sick, there's money that goes into people getting sick. My wildlife uh, friends and colleagues, uh, they could only get money to work on wildlife if the wildlife were causing human disease problems. So that's, and, and I'm standing back and going, well, that's, to me, that's very short sighted. And that's, you can solve human disease problems by making things worse for everything else and worse for the next generation. Uh, you know, just to give you a, a bad example, if you are a couple of bad examples, you can get rid of, of some diseases by simply, you know, they, they thought we could get rid of malaria by spraying DDT on everything. And they almost got rid of it in a lot of places, but there are all kinds of negative consequences of that. You can fill in swamps and build parking lots and that will also get rid of a lot of malaria and it will create all kinds of problems. You can minimize, if you want um, food, uh, certain kinds of hunger, you can bring down the price of the grocery store price of food by going to economies of scale and centralizing and global distribution. And that has huge negative consequences in terms of social interactions, in terms of environmental issues. And now, in fact, in a very short period of time, because this in the food system, that centralization largely took place in the 70s and 80s. And by the 90s, we were starting to get kickback from all the natural systems. So then we started seeing basically a global pandemic of things like salmonella and and even even influenza as as these organizations, these agri-food corporations were moving into marginal lands and encroaching on lands where there were uh, 
uh, waterborne uh, water birds, ducks and geese, which are the natural habitat for influenza. And so then you start getting that spill over. So you have all of these, um, if you want systemic feedbacks coming in. And for me, that's where all the big questions were. So it, it you know, there was this push after the Brutland report uh, for, you know, sustainable development. And, you know, nobody really knew what that meant. We had a program in Canada, a research program called the Tri-Council Eco-Research Program, where the government, you know, God bless them, they were, they forced the granting agencies to work together, the social sciences, the medical and natural sciences and engineering. And, and there was a lot of griping from the granting agencies because they, you know, they like their independence. But basically, the government said, we want to know, we want integrated projects to look at land use and environment, health, all of these things and how they, how they interact. And so there were things that spun out of that. There were things that came out of the Rio summit. A lot of this stuff, um, uh, a lot of these, if you want, uh, activities, initiatives, they foundered because people weren't sure what, how to do this. And so, I mean, one of the things that's emerged recently, again, is something called One Health, which in a sense, came down bureaucratically. American Veterinary and Medical Associations, World Health, uh, World Association for Animal Health. Um, they like the idea of integrating everything. And they have this view that you can do it as a kind of a top-down framework. Now, I'm glad they're thinking in that direction. But in fact, if we want to achieve that sort of an outcome, then my experience, you know, I've done research all over the world, is that you start at the bottom up. If you want to have, find out what communities think about health, we ask them, you know, what, what are the things that you value here? Well, you know, that, so there's basic things like water and food and, and so how much does, does control over those things, uh, play into this? Well, they would, you know, they want to, don't want to be dependent on food coming from elsewhere. Well, that has implications for, for local democracy and local control over your, your food systems and so on. It doesn't mean you don't import anything, but it means you're not, you're not on life support from some outside agency. So you begin that way and embedded in that are, is all the cultural history, our people's values. Um, and then you start looking at, how do these things link together and how do you, oh, I, I, I hesitate to use the word scale up because usually historically what that's meant is get bigger and bigger. Um, I tend to see it more as how do all of these, you know, personal, local, community, uh, regional activities, how do they network with each other and how do those networks um, if you want, you get networks and networks of networks and so on. So a lot of my activities have been embedded in, you know, the community of practice, if you want, for ecosystem approaches to health in Canada. And there's one for Latin America and the Caribbean. And there's it's in Southeast Asia that I've been involved in uh, quite a bit, trying to get people with local initiatives talking to each other and, and in a sense, mimicking um, the way ecosystems work. A lot of stuff happens locally, but then there are also, I mean, birds migrate and insects migrate and other animals, they migrate. In the same way, if we can talk across these different uh, ecosystems, if you were watching me, you would see my hands waving in the air because um, I tend to look, you know, start locally in this in this context and then I expand out. So what does this mean? And coming into this if you want um, one of the examples, well, let, let me just shift a little bit. The community of practice for ecosystem approaches to health. One of the reasons that was started was we had, uh, some of us had research projects in various parts of the world where um, it seemed to be relatively easy for people to get this, if you want, and, you know, get in terms of understand it. So I would work in Kathmandu, or I'd work in Uganda or Kenya, and you you talk about well, there's your health and there's your food and your employment and your values. And these things are all kind of 
connected, you know? And they're like, yeah, well, that's completely understandable. So we're going to work with you to try to uh, understand what these dynamics are and how we can come up with some sort of a satisfactory resolution that's not final, but it you keep adapting and changing as the as the cultural and climate context changes. So people would get that, but then um, one of the big funding agencies for doing this kind of work, the International Development Research Center in Ottawa, they realized we didn't have a strong body of of a, or a network of people in Canada who could partner with these other people. So they decide, well, let's see if we can get this a community of practice, if you want, in Canada. So we started teaching courses, and one of the things we did with regard to health, so we would have it at uh, UNBC in Prince George, uh, Margot Parks there, she's a physician who did a, a PhD study in watersheds and health, uh, and Quebec and Guelph, um, uh, University of um, in Moncton. Uh, so we had a whole network of people but we would do things like, okay, we want to talk about health. Let's talk about it. Let's say we're in, in Prince George. We'll talk about it in this valley. Um, we'll have these little cards, and people will be assigned uh, randomly. Uh, our, talk talk about health in, and pretend that you're a lumberjack. Pretend that you're a tree. Pretend that you're the river. Pretend that you are a pregnant woman or an indigenous person, or um, the birds that, that fly through here. So they would have to identify with that that particular, uh, indi those individuals, those groups, and they would be uh, interspecific, if you want. It wouldn't just be, well, let's look at health from the poor people and the rich people or the employed and unemployed. Those are all important, but let's Let's look at it across different species. What is a healthy, what does it mean for it to have a healthy fish population? Um, and, and you find that, okay, you know, the fishermen would have a different or the fisher, the fisher people would have a different perspective on a healthy fish population maybe than the fish themselves. Um, so you begin to look at health from all these different angles. And that's, we try to, to work with that both within Canada and then overseas to create these these networks, if you want. And like I said, that there's this, this uh, there's there was kind of a split, if you want, uh, in terms of the movement. As you can imagine, because it looks like it's, um, it looks like it's so challenging. How can you ever deal with something that this, that this is, is this complex? Um, and I can come back to that in a minute, but you know, we don't have a way to think about it. We don't have a scientific approach. So let's simplify it. Let's talk about either ecosystem health or let's talk about one health. And the people that really pushed for that were people in institutions where it was much easier to terms of think of, of fixed boundaries. My mandate is to look at this. Your mandate is to look at that. And and that works within certain boundaries, but the world we live in doesn't actually, you know, you look at climate change, you look at the uh, disease spread, you look at disappearing species. Those things don't respect those, those geographic boundaries or those, those, uh, uh, departmental mandates, if you want. You know, that's a health department. This is agriculture department. Why are you talking to us about, you know, uh, food when you're in the health side. You should be talking about something else, vaccination programs, which are important, but that's, if we're trying to look at how these things interact, then somehow we need to find a way to think about all of these things. And so on the one hand, there's, there's a problem with the way we have thought about science. And, and, and um, I always have to say, I'm not, dissing science. I really, I like science, but there's a tendency in the way we've been trained to focus in, uh, narrow down our vision on a few things. So we can study a butterfly, we can study uh, bacteria, we can study certain animals, we can study people, um, and then you can narrow down within that even, and you focus, and you learn a lot about stuff, if you want, about those individuals. But a lot of the issues we're facing now and in fact come from 
a lack of understanding the world not as just things, but relationships among things. Um, there's been a little bit of work on the obvious stuff, like, okay, gravity is a set of relationships. It's not necessarily, you don't know what gravity is unless you see things together and they interact in some ways. Um, in the same way, there's there are chemical communications and so on. A lot of those, um, uh, the, the kind of relationship stuff, the, 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 the conversations, if you want, among species, among microbiomes and, and uh, people and other animals, among trees, among uh, a whole different species have not been well studied, in part because you can't do, you can't do a randomized trial or experiment in a lab to actually understand all of those things. So then people, they fall back and they say, well, we'll do mathematical modeling. And that's useful. Direct observations, those are useful. Lab stuff, that's useful. But somehow trying to find a way to pull it together, you need all of those things. And maybe it comes from my my veterinary background that I say, well, okay, we're collecting all this stuff. We get lots of different kind of information. And if I'm working with uh, an animal owner, let's say, um, I talk to them. I like what, what you know. What do you see? What's your experience? So it's a different kind of evidence. It's like you know, some people would talk about indigenous knowledge, but it's something more than that. It's it's the experience of living in the world and our history and our the narratives we tell about ourselves and how do those things then interact with the best that we know from all of the science we've been doing. And um, one of the places it comes out, certainly that I've been uh, working with, there's a group in Europe. Uh, well, they started in the States and in Europe. They work on something called post-normal science. And that's really science in situations where there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, where there are conflicts of values, uh, where their decision people need feel like they need to make decisions about things so you have for instance uh, let's say uh, mad cow disease or you've got gmos and it doesn't matter how much data you gather um, we still have a system that's sufficiently complex that we need to be able to make a decision but there's not going to we're not going to be able to say yes this is the problem and here's a solution we've got what are called wicked problems, where you solve one part of the problem. Okay, we know how to produce lots of food, but we've also created conditions for environmental deterioration, economic inequity, um, disease spread, all these kind of things. Or, you know, we solve one problem and we create a whole bunch of others. The only way that I can think of to get out of that, and this is where the post-normal science comes in, is you expand your peer group. So you pull in evidence from people that live in all these different places. You pull in evidence from from scientists, from people who are, are you know, let's say farming or environmental management managers or and ecologists and biologists. And you start pulling all this together. And then the question is, how do we go about making a decision? Well, it's got to be a collective decision. I mean, it's just because we're all in this. We're all inside. There's nobody outside saying, this is the right thing to do. And there's all this uncertainty. You say, well, let's get together. Let's get all our best information, including people's experiences and, and our values and say, let's, let's try this. And then you have to say, well, if, if that's, you know, if the, if the, the decision is, tr is framed in terms of let's try this, then you have to have some way to come back to it and say, well, we need to be able to reassess it. Who's going to do that? How are we going to know? what a good outcome is because different people have different if you want good outcomes right so it's um you've got all of these complex dynamics and to me um that's much more realistic if you want and much more sustainable even though it's 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 very difficult it's more challenging and difficult than than uh than politics because you're pulling all of these other things in uh, but it's also more uh, it's more complex and open than what we can we traditionally view as science so it's 
I talk about working in the muddled middle, if you want, because that's where most of us live. And how do we make decisions there? To me, that's what an ecosystem approach to health is. It's not just about preventing disease. It's not just about human health, not just about the health of certain species. Uh, it's about all of these things and how they fit together. And there's no, there's no silver bullet here. There's no, you know, oh, here's the answer. Give us a few years. We'll put in place this program and everything's going to be just fine. Um, it's, that's not, doesn't happen that way. So for me, that's, I mean, I've been going on and on here about this. It's partly <laughs> when I, I do, did things for my students and still sometimes now when I give talks, I'll do what they call a, sp a spaghetti diagram. And, um, it's it's more informative if you draw it together with a group of people. And I've done this in Nepal and Kenya and Uganda and various other places. You start with what people see as being a central issue. And then you start looking at how does this relate to that and to that and to that. So if I'm talking about, well, I've got chickens in my backyard. Let's let if we're talking about people want to eat chicken, it's uh, and it's partly my fault as an epidemiologist, it's, it's lean, it's low fat, it's good for you, blah, 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 all these kind of things. Uh, it's got a good uh, feed conversion ratio. Well, that's, that can be an issue. So if, if you want to grow chickens and you go back to, um, Henry the fourth of France in 1600 said, uh, you know, if God, uh, spares me, I would like to uh, live to see a chicken in the pot of every peasant every Sunday. Well, he was assassinated by a religious zealot about 10 years later. So that, you know, God didn't preserve him. But anyway, the um, what came out of that, we have this dream, right? So then people said, OK, we can, we know how to produce chickens. And a lot of this happened. It didn't happen on a big scale, like I said, till after the Second World War, when people figured out uh, how to what they figured out, first of all, what vitamins were and then what vitamin D was, because until they knew that they couldn't put chickens inside. Uh, the chickens had to get their vitamin D activated by being outside and getting the UV light. So once they figured out how to make it, they could put chickens inside. They could raise hundreds of thousands of them, millions of them in large groups. Uh, so we went to economies of scale. And what that does then is, okay, we've had these, you know, we have feed inputs. And if you're going small scale, you can have local feed inputs. Uh, chickens in my backyard can eat bugs and, and dirt and those kinds of things and seeds. Um, as soon as you go to economies of scale, then you're drawing on, you're bringing in water and food and all kinds of things from all over the place. And you're using energy, a lot of energy to, to maintain it, uh, whether it's human energy or or, you know, you've got computerized systems like we do in large parts of Canada and the U.S., so those require heating and cooling and, and automated feed systems. So you've got energy inputs. And then you've got all this stuff coming out. You've got things that are considered waste like, uh, like feces. If you've got a few chickens in the backyard, it's not a big problem. They're, they're, it's fertilizer. Even if you've got a few hundred chickens, um, that's manageable. You can compost it and you can distribute it locally and it's good for the gardens and so on. If you've got millions of chickens, it becomes a problem. You have contaminated water. You've got contaminated food. The chickens go through a slaughterhouse and they have cross contamination of salmonella. They distribute it all over the world. So it's brought the economy of scale has brought down the price at the supermarket, but it's done so at a huge cost that has been externalized to the system. And we're paying for that now. We all pay for it. So then the, can we step back and say, Looking at all these relationships, the feed input, the water input, the, and the outputs, the, the excrement and the, and, and the dead bodies and all of these things, the, the feathers, can we look at those things and say, is there a way that we can manage, is there a scale at which we can manage it that's more human, that we can reuse some of these things? Because excrement's not waste, it's just a resource that hasn't been used. Um, so you focus on it, there's lots of nitrogen and phosphorus and water and things like that. You can, you can use it to grow flies on and, and feed it to, uh, feed it to, back to chickens if you want. You could create a protein source out of it and, and, uh, put it into energy bars. So you can do things with those feces that 
that demonstrate it's it, ecologically it's not in ecosystems excrement's not a problem it just gets it's just a way of recycling nutrients and water and those and energy uh, we've made it into a problem by the way we've structured how we produce and distribute food which doesn't which is might make business sense at one level but it's really ecologically stupid i mean the people that run these things they are obviously never taken they don't understand they understand individual animal biology maybe if we have this temperature and this uh, uh, th this humidity and we put in this kind of food then they're mostly going to be reasonably happy in this genetics and they're going to grow this fast um, but that doesn't pay any attention to thinking ecologically and to me that's where the that's where our our only sustainable future is is if we take Ecological thinking, and we apply it to everything: transportation, food production, uh, entertainment. Look at the connections to everything else. Um, I remember people when there was the big uh, explosion on the the derrick in the Gulf of Mexico, the oil derrick. Uh, people sitting around uh, on a patio in on plastic chairs and with a, with a you know a patio table there complaining about you know all you know all this use of of oil products and and we shouldn't be doing that and they had no idea that you know the the Gore-Tex jackets and the and the the plastic patio chairs and all of those things were in fact oil products they came out of the tar sands or they came out of the Gulf of Mexico um we just don't have a sense of ourselves as one species among all these other species what those interactions are how they communicate with each other, how they communicate to us, but we don't listen. I mean, there are chemical communications, and I actually see, uh, I, I, for me, one of the positive things about disease spread through food and those kinds of things is that it's a reminder. It's like, okay, you know, it's, I, I once wrote a book called The Chickens Fight Back. It's, it's the only way those animals can respond get us to listen is through the you know the the bacteria they carry around or the toxins that are in their flesh and then we get affected we say oh where did that come from well it's because of what we've done to these other animals and how we've housed them and those kinds of things so to me that's the way i think about ecosystem approaches to health well that's thank you so much for all of that and that is manifesting exactly why i was so excited to interview you is that you're modeling this process that I think is absolutely crucial of of roots intertwining and mm -hmm. of um, all these relationships and I have like four or five little quick vignettes I want to sort of okay. throw at you and then you can take any of them anywhere you want can I just throw in one more thing please please what one of the responses I get from people who listen to me and from students in particular was that it's overwhelming. Everything's related to everything else. How are we going to you know, manage this? The point is not that each of us knows everything about everything. The point is then that, in fact, we don't. So we need to collaborate with a whole lot of other people to try to understand this. And we need to observe a whole lot of other things going on around us. So it's not just me. It's it's not possible for one person to to be the expert in this area. It's a collective expertise, if you want. A collective expertise that extends to non-humans and also into the past and into the future. Yes. If if we can figure out how to listen, I mean, that's part of it, right? Well, I think that's that's. I don't want to say it's everything, but I'm going to say it's everything. Okay. Um. Yeah. I mean, it's everything with with an asterisk, because yeah, because everything isn't by itself either. Right. So a few responses. One of them is that a very simple thing. I interviewed Paul Ehrlich a couple of weeks ago about creatures who have large populations and then these populations have been extirpated really quickly. Mm -hmm. Passenger pigeons, uh, the great banks of cod, etc. And I asked him, so give me an example of the ramifications for passenger pigeons populations disappearing almost overnight on a, you know, on, a, on an ecological scale. They just put overnight. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, one example would be that uh, the pigeons ate tremendous amounts of mast. And mm -hmm. 
chestnuts or whatever. And they, the disappearance of the chestnuts, I'm sorry, the disappearance of the passenger pigeons meant there were a whole lot more chestnuts, which meant that field mice or forest mice, various species of mice, their populations increased dramatically. Mm -hmm. They are one of the hosts of uh, the ticks who yeah. are Lyme disease. Right. So decrease in passenger pigeons. You wouldn't think, you know, what do passenger pigeons have to do with Lyme disease? Bingo, it's just three generations away or two generations away. We figure out what it is. And you come at it from a slightly different angle, and you've got um, you've got the the uh, explosions. Maybe not the right word, but the large increase in white-tailed deer and in the uh, in the U.S. Uh, Northeast, and that's also got a whole complex uh, uh, history of, of of negative consequences. Some of them of decisions that were 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 not necessarily bad. I mean, that's that's part of the issue, right? People abandon farms. Um, uh, they discouraged hunting of deer. Um, they shot, they, they didn't like deer predators. So let's get rid of the wolves, but we won't shoot the deer and we're going to abandon the farmland. And then we've got all these white tailed deer who are part of that tick, uh, Lyme disease, uh, cycle. So you have a, a whole, it's not just the passenger pigeons. And the other part of the passenger pigeons is, um, one wonders, Birds produce a lot of excrement. Um, they must have fertilized a whole lot of things along their, their migratory routes and, and the impoverishment of the soil and which plants, uh, disappeared. Nobody's looked at that because that's a set of relationships that, that you can't study that necessarily in the lab. It requires historical understanding and people that lived there and, and those kinds of things. I did see an interesting, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that part up too, because I did see a study maybe 12, 15 years ago, just one study about a possible relationship between passenger pigeons uh, extirpation and uh, the chestnut blight because they would poop. It would be like snow is my understanding mm -hmm. how much yeah, they would poop. Yeah, that's what I've heard. And that was very acidic. And the chestnuts had evolved, co-evolved with the passenger pigeons. And the American chestnuts really liked that acidic soil. And without that uh, acidification of the soil through the poop, it weakened the chestnuts, made them more susceptible to the blight. It was a thesis that was, I thought was really interesting. And, and this leads to the second thing I was going to say, which is I've always loved this line by David Ehrenfeld, which is nature is not only more complex than we think, it's more complex than we can think. Which brings us back to you, which is which brings me back to one of the things I was so excited about interviewing you, is that, well, I'm I'm going to go a different direction again. That my 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 first degree was in physics, and one of the things that blew me away about science that is both a strength and a weakness is one of the ways it works is that you you take a thesis and then you eliminate all of the variables except for one in a laboratory. And then you, you do your experiment to make sure that there is actually this causal relationship between, between independent variable one and dependent variable two. And then what you do is you then generalize that back out into the real world. And that is, as you said earlier, an incredibly powerful tool. But it also, by definition, doesn't study relations. It only studies the specific relationship because everything else you're acknowledging a priori that that these other relationships aren't the ones I care about. Those kinds of things keep being rediscovered uh, by people who are paying attention. And you're right. In a laboratory, that was one of the things that the reasons I couldn't stay in a laboratory. And one of the frustrations in doing and studying epidemics um, in in context is that you can get various kinds of information, but you can't, you can try to model it, but the more precise the model is, the less realistic it is. And the more realistic is the more kind of, uh, there are more uncertainties built into it. And, um, and I just think that's something, uh, it, it gives me a sense of humility. And I think that's, that should be a, a basic prerequisite of being a good scientist. You talked about your first degree being in physics. My first degree was in English language and literature. So, you know, I was going to be a 
poet. That's why a lot of my first books were poetry. And I realized you can't make a living <laughs> writing poetry. I should have known that if I'd have looked around, right? Um, and I said, well, how can I make a living? And I became a vet. And then, I, and then I just kept asking why. And then I studied epidemiology. And then I got into these larger questions where the diseases that we saw and the health outcomes we saw were a function not just of the biological phenomena, but the interaction between culture and and biology. And some people talk about socio-ecological systems, uh, which is a useful way of putting some bounds around it or eco-social systems where you have it identifies that there are social and ecological sides. Um, that's already a simplification. If you walk out into into the world outside, there isn't a social system and an ecological system. It's all one big set of interactions and we put boundaries around them in order to study and manage subsets of it and that's just you know a practical thing you want to make a decision you can't make a decision about everything you can't account for all of the uncertainties but we can learn some things and we can make some decisions and we can at least make short to medium term plans the weather people do that all the time it doesn't matter how much information you've got the biggest computer you've got they can't really predict beyond three or four or five days max, but they have these long-term trends. They look historically and we adapt to that and we say, well, it tends to be warmer this time of year and colder that time of year. And of course, now with, with climate change, all that stability that we've assumed is out the window and that wreaks havoc with, you know, wreaks havoc with short-term planning, which is fine. You know, I can, if there's a storm here, I can close the window. Um, but it also our whole uh, infrastructure for for water and sewage treatment is built around a certain flow of water. So if you have droughts and floods, all of our infrastructure for preventing cholera, which is a water based flush sewage system, is can't handle it anymore. It's out the window. What do we do now? Right? That's a long term structural investment. And I think we have to figure out how do we how do we create solutions or resolutions that are not focused on efficiency, which has been the big thing in the late 20th century, and more on adaptability, you know, redundancy, uh, interactions. Uh, how can we adapt to new and unsettling situations? And that, again, that brings me back down to uh, networking and talking to other people and community based, but not just isolated communities, communities networking and talking to other communities. Um, it's, I mean, it's the upside of, for instance, being able to talk on Skype and being able to, you know, the, 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 the social networking, which is, it's got huge problems and it, it's also useful for a lot of things. And I think it's, uh, you know, we, Trying to work with that and adapt to the changing situation, I think that's uh, that's what we're going to need to have to do. So we have like three or four minutes left, mm. and I would like to ask you a wind down question. Except I also want to say one more thing. So you can either respond to the thing I say, or you can do a wind. You know, however you want to wind down, or you can do both. And as you've been talking, I've been thinking about. I was asked to participate in a children's health conference back. 20 years ago, and uh, I was asked by the organizers of the thing to bring in an ecological perspective. And so um, I kept saying, how can we have healthy children when the natural world is being destroyed? Uh -huh. And let's talk about the children of the future, etc. And I was met with tremendous hostility by the uh, sort of mainstream children's health advocates, who one of whom actually said to me, why are you wasting our time talking about the apocalypse when I'm trying to save a child's life right now? And those are two s separate questions. I mean, I've got that pushback as well. You know, if the barn's burning down, then you don't want to talk about what would be a better design of a barn. I, I think it's actually... It's a mistake to think it's one thing or the other. We, it's, and I've had that pushback at public health conferences sometimes they, who would argue we've spent decades trying to get authorities to recognize social determinants of health, uh, poverty, inequity, uh, uh, those kinds of things. 
And now you're coming in and talking about ecology. It's a distraction. You know, don't bother us with that. And it, it's, it's not, to me, it's not a bother. It's, it's a difference between rescuing this child now and, and doing some short term things and, and trying to find ways so that those children don't, the next generation of children don't end up in that same situation. So I, it, the problem is that people talk past each other. It's like medicine versus health. It's, um, and, and there is no easy way through that other than to keep talking and sharing information. Um, there are contributions from, that can be made from all sides, but it requires some listening. And I can understand how people who've struggled to get their voices heard, um, are upset if somebody else comes in and, and suggest something new and then they say we had trouble getting money for this child health clinic or for this uh, safe injection site or wh whatever it is and now you're coming along and saying you know we should be looking at you know the air and the water and, and how we produce and distribute food I don't think they're separate I remember being in one community and I'll do this very quickly where we had um, ecologists who were restoring a particular wetland which was a, a, a a super fun toxic site in Canada. And, and it was also an industrial area where there was a lot of unemployment because of changes in, in industries, the steel industry in particular. And you got those two people in the same room and it was like they'd never talked to each other. And I said to the community activist, I said, so you're looking for jobs for people. If they found tar sands under the city of Hamilton, in this case it was a sort of a steel city. Um, and that, the money from that were, and the jobs from that was equally distributed, you know, complete uh, uh, social equity and economic equity here. Would that satisfy you? And it was like they'd never thought of it in those terms. Uh, they were thinking, in terms, well, we, we need more money and then we need to distribute it well. And that's true, but there are different ways to generate money. There are different ways to create jobs. And I think, you know, places like Alberta are struggling with that now. Um, if we want to move ahead and we have to, you know, there are different kinds of jobs that have different kind of interactions that will promote health and at the same time deal with some of these equity issues. So, so we have like one minute. So, mm. so what is the take home that you want people to, to take from this interview? I heard this great interview today. What was it about? It was such and such. And I know that goes against everything you've said. Just, you know, a soundbite <laughs> goes against every single thing you've said, but that's the way it goes. Um, look around, pay attention, uh, listen to other people, look at other species around you. Think of the consequences of what you eat and do every day, not just in terms of your own health, but in terms of everything around you. And look at those relationships um, as, as a kind of a, I don't know how to explain it, a spaghetti network. Try to draw pictures. This is what I eat. This is where it comes from. Uh, this is who was handling it before. These are the consequences of that. And it can drive you crazy. And then you back off and you say, you know, one of the, the determinants of good health is having a sense of humor and a sense of humility. So you back off and you say, we do the best we can in this situation and pay attention. I guess that's the big thing. Well, thank you so much for that, and thank you for being on the program. Thank you for your work in the world, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been David Waltner-Taves. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.